Well, welcome everybody. Happy Easter. So glad to have you with us this morning as we celebrate the risen Savior. I'm Ben Bigoet, and this is Mark Jarvanen and Andy Larson. And uh, welcome, especially to you who are watching from our respective congregations at Oak Hill and Community of Joy and Ebenezer. And if you're just tuning in, checking things out this morning, happy Easter to you as well. Well, it's amazing, guys. He's risen, right? He is risen. You bet. Absolutely. (laughs) And so how cool is it? We were talking earlier about the things that we would normally be experiencing on Easter Sunday. You know, we'd be together in our churches. We'd be face-to-face, singing out loud. I know one of the things that all of us collectively agreed that we really miss about this time is the Easter breakfast, right? All of us have Easter breakfast is the best, right? super. The the pancakes, the eggs, the sausage, the fruit, coffee, all that good stuff. And so obviously we can't quite do that today. Day, but uh, we're going to take a peek into some of your homes and kitchens and dining rooms and enjoy breakfast with you. So let's take a look. This is good stuff. This is great. Hi, next like best it. thing. Thanks, awesome. everybody, for sending those in. Fun to share breakfast with you this morning. Did you guys hear that? Yeah. What's you, up? You expecting anybody? or? I have an Amazon package coming, so it'll just wait a little bit. Okay. Whoa. Hello. Hello. Well, hey, wait a second. I recognize you. You look, you look really familiar. I mean, I can't quite put a face to a name, but... You're, you're Doubting Thomas. That's who you are, right? <laughs> doubting Thomas. Yeah, hi, guys. Uh, listen, Doubting Thomas. Uh, with Easter being services online this year, I thought, what a perfect opportunity for me to launch my digital rebranding tour. Doubting Thomas just, it's not quite fair. I'm here to announce my new brand, Believing Thomas. Okay, well, it makes sense, I guess. Hey, you know, nice of you to drop by and spend a little time with us on Easter. I'm going to, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Pastor Ben, and uh, this is Pastor Mark. Hey, I, I can't shake your hand today, but uh, I just want to say, wow, I'm just so impressed with this opportunity to meet you. I hear some people call you Didymus because you're a twin. Well, no offense, but... If you have a twin brother, I'd like to see him and you in the same room with all that beard. Well, Pretty th- nice. I'm in awe. Yeah, Thomas, maybe you haven't caught on, but actually a lot of people are cutting their beards uh, with this whole pandemic thing that's going on. You know, they call it the COVID cut. Maybe you've seen that. What? No, no beards? I, I'd have to see that to believe it. <laughs> okay. Well, anyways, this is, this is Pastor Andrew. Big fan, big fan. I'm a natural beard petter, but I will... I'll keep back. I'll keep back today. And I see you as kind of the original Tommy boy that you kind of have to experience everything before you actually, it sinks in. So it's great to see you. You were there at the resurrection. Just tell us a little bit about that. Uh, uh, See, that's the thing. I wasn't actually there for the resurrection. I found out about it after the fact, and that's when all this doubting Thomas stuff began. But it was too good to be true. I needed to see Jesus to believe it. Okay, so when that point actually came, when you actually got to see Jesus, I mean, tell us about that. What was that like for you? I mean, it was incredible. He knew exactly what I needed to see to believe. And I never stopped believing. That was the moment I became believing Thomas. So what you're saying is your life really changed at that moment. And what would you say is the biggest difference for you? I mean, everything is different now. I'm saved. Jesus was resurrected. And ever since then, I haven't been able to stop talking about it. I am so excited, and that's why I'm here on Easter Sunday. This is the best day of the year. I've never stopped believing in Jesus. I'm believing Thomas now. Okay. Fantastic. Well, that's great. Hey, thanks yeah. for stopping by and spending some time with us. Sounds like you got your work cut out for you. There's a lot of online services going on today, so we'll let you have at it. But thanks for stopping by and saying hi. Yeah, guys, it was great to meet you, and I got to go viral now. So. Well, that was pretty great, huh, guys? That was awesome. Yeah. Doubting yeah. Thomas. Who would have thought? That's yeah. Great. What an opportunity. Yeah. Well, hey, as we continue in our worship this morning, we prepare our hearts and minds to be able to sing and praise His name. Our call to worship this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. 
and then verses 27 through 30. This is the message of hope, we believe. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. At this time, I invite you to sing along with us as we worship the Lord right where you're at with whoever you're with. Sing out and let's praise his name together this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's just so good to be uh, with you this morning online. Happy Easter. Um, if you could sing with us, let's worship together this morning.
It's so good to be able to worship in song on this Easter Sunday morning, even from our own homes. 
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Romans 6, 3 to 11. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity this morning to come to you on Easter Sunday and we approach the throne with such awe and joy over what your Son has done for us. We are so thankful to be able to worship together and to be able to still gather, albeit virtually, to celebrate you and your resurrection, Lord. We thank you so much for what that means, and we pray as we head into this time of hearing the word that we are able to be led by you and that you would reveal yourself to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, what a treat it is to be getting to celebrate Easter with you and talk about this life-changing reality that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And some of you might be wondering why we're all sitting up here like this at the same time. And, and the truth is that we couldn't all agree on who was going to give the Easter message. So it kind of became a big argument. So rather than do that, we figured let's, we could just all do it together. So, I mean, it didn't actually go down that way. But we're reconciled. Yeah, it's fine. It's going to work. So, But today we get to celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive, that he's living and he's at work in our lives. And I feel like this year that kind of carries a really special significance. I mean, we are invited to live in the reality of Easter every year, but I think this year with all the things that have maybe been, uh, had to change or be readjusted or rescheduled, I'm so thankful that Easter doesn't fall into that category, that Easter isn't canceled, Easter isn't rescheduled, it's already happened at the perfect time. And even though people have tried to cancel Easter, there's been things like the cross, and the tomb, and the large rock, and even Satan himself tried to say, this isn't happening, and yet, think again. And so, Easter came, right? Nothing could stop it. Absolutely. Yeah, it just came. And to borrow the words of a big green Grinch, it came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And so together, let's look at this amazing reality of the resurrection. From Matthew chapter 28, reading the first 10 verses. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I've told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Now, I think I can speak for everybody that's sitting here and saying that this would have been spectacular, right? Almost unbelievable. I mean, how incredible would it have been to see the reactions of these women as they were making their way and on their way to the tomb? I mean, put yourself in their situation. I'm sure there was many emotions that were kind of swirling around in their minds and hearts after all that they had seen the last couple of days. They were probably still in mourning. They were probably still thinking about all they had been witness to and how it had all happened so fast. Jesus, who they had been following for years, had been taken away from them. He had been arrested and crucified and buried in less than a day. They were left with so many questions and all these things 
left unanswered. And, and needless to say, all these feelings going on inside of them, we can pretty well assume what their expectations were going to be as they made their way to the tomb. We're told they had, been, they had brought spices and perfumes with them to anoint Jesus' body because he had been dead for several days and decay had no doubt started to set in. And Mark's gospel account even tells us that as they were on their way to the tomb, they were wondering to themselves, how are we going to roll away this big stone that's in front of the entrance? I think it would be more than safe to say that what they saw instead was something that completely took their breath away. Their eyes were deceiving them, right? I mean, this absolutely is the last thing they were expecting to see. There was no sign of the guards that had been posted around the tomb. The large immovable stone had been rolled away. And what's more, there's this bright glowing angel sitting on it, kind of taking everything in as what he had just witnessed. The missing body, the angel's news to them that Jesus wasn't there, that he was alive. I mean, imagine them stumbling away from the tomb and, and almost bumping into Jesus, who is not at all what they expected him to look like. He was very much alive and talking to them. I mean, talk about a roller coaster of emotions. When I think of the vast contrast of what these women saw versus what they were expecting to see, my mind goes to an experience in my own life when I was in fifth grade. And I remember it was a summer evening. It was near dusk. Uh, at that point where the sun is kind of just about to set below the horizon line. And I just finished riding my bike and was walking back to the house. And I just happened to glance up our driveway into the setting sun. And that's when I saw it. It was the largest bird I had ever seen in my life, just glistening in the background. Of the sun. And it looked like it was an ostrich. And so at this point, you, get, you better believe, I'm like rubbing my eyes in disbelief going like, what is this? What am I seeing? What did I have for dinner again? That, what is going on here? And so I started to approach this towering figure, and it just kind of glided into the ditch. And by this point in time, my siblings and my dad had seen my curiosity, and they were right there with me. And sure enough, it was an emu that was running across our yard and entering into the bean field behind me. Now, just for reference, this is a picture of an emu, okay? And also for reference, emus are native to Australia, as in only Australia. So I have photo evidence and eyewitness accounts to prove this, of course, but the question becomes, what's an Australian bird doing in the backyard of rural Minnesota? And I will say that's a story for another time, but needless to say, of all the options of birds or animals that I could have seen in my Minnesota backyard, it would be safe to say that one of the last things I would expect to see is an emu from Australia, which I did. Now, if it can be believable that I saw an emu in my Minnesota backyard, I wonder what the believability is of someone seeing someone who was dead but is now alive. I mean, how amazing it must have been for these women to come to the tomb that morning and have all their expectations turned upside down as they spoke with the risen Jesus. Easter is amazing, Ben, and it's comforting too, but my heart goes out to people who have a hard time believing or just refuse for whatever reason to believe, claiming that the resurrection was something based on fake news, something that somebody desperately wished or needed to be true, but was knowingly based on outright lies. Actually, as Christians, we do believe in Easter by faith. But it's not a blind faith, and that's what I think people don't understand. It's not an uninformed faith. We have eyewitness accounts from people who offer very solid evidence that the resurrection really did occur. And that's an important piece of evidence, the historicity of the resurrection. There's plenty of historical data that honest investigators haven't been able to ignore or simply explain away. We've already heard from the gospel record that was read earlier by Ben that the heavy stone that covered the entrance to the tomb had already been rolled away uh, after his death on the cross. And uh, by the next morning when the women came to check the tomb, they were going to anoint the body of Jesus, uh, the stone was rolled away. And so I want you to consider with me this morning several evidences for the resurrection that I think are very important and uh, which 
critics of the resurrection really haven't been adequately able to explain. First of all, Jesus' body was missing. Some say that even after the hideous uh, manner in which Jesus was tortured and, and died, uh, proven by a Roman soldier's thrust into the side of Jesus with a spear, and how an issue of water and blood came forth indicating death, that Jesus wasn't really dead when he was laid in the tomb, and somehow he escaped the tomb on his own, which seems highly unlikely to me given his condition when he was laid in the tomb. Some say that the Jews conspired with Rome and took the body of Jesus, but think about that for a moment. If the Jews could have produced the body and stopped the preaching of Jesus' resurrection, don't you think they would have? But they didn't. They couldn't because they didn't have the body. Neither did the Romans. Another point is that some say the body was actually stolen. As stated, though, the Jews certainly had no motive to steal the body of Jesus any more than the Romans did. Aha, you say, the disciples must have stolen it. But what about the Roman guards who were on duty? That was uh, mentioned in the scripture reading. And how many men would it require to move that two-ton stone, almost a foot thick? And what about the disciples' initial disbelief of the women's uh, report on Easter morning? The facts just don't point to the disciples stealing the body of Jesus. And so you have the empty tomb that uh, provides convincing truth, convincing uh, proofs for the resurrection, but there's more evidence to look at. Jesus was seen by many after his resurrection, and this is no small point. Not only by his disciples and the two on the road to Emmaus was he seen, but Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that he was seen by as many as 500 people at one time. Furthermore, another point is that even if the disciples had stolen the body, and we've already demonstrated how unlikely that seems, why would they later risk their lives for something they knew to be a lie? I mean, people just don't die for what they know isn't true. The disciples became passionate evangelists, all of them, after the Pentecost event where they received the Holy Spirit. And putting their lives on the line for the sake of the gospel was something they willingly did, passionately. In fact, John was the only one of the disciples who uh, was alive after Jesus' crucifixion who was not martyred as uh, a Christian witness. Fifthly, besides how do we really explain the rapid growth of Christianity after the, uh, the uh, death of Jesus? Thousands believe these resurrection reports within weeks after the event itself. You read the early chapter of Acts. Uh, the end of the second chapter of Acts speaks about 3,000 people coming to faith as a result of Peter's sermon on Pentecost Day. You know, it's true that you can perhaps dupe an individual or even a small group, but it's pretty hard to dupe the masses who would have heard uh, that sermon that day and come to faith as a result by the thousands. And so a final proof would be that even the secular historians uh, of that era referred to the resurrection in some of their writings. Names like Thallus, Suetonius, Tacitus, and Pliny all record the references to this particular event. Even the Jewish historian Josephus also wrote about Jesus' death and resurrection. So having given some of these proofs, these evidences, where does that leave us after hearing them? Well, according to a host of Christian apologists, including former atheist and agnostic uh, C.S. Lewis, who many have heard of, an Oxford, Oxford professor uh, from England, uh, and more recently, former atheists like uh, the former investigative newspaper reporter Lee Strobel, the author of many books on the subject, who after interviewing scores of experts in the faith with the ultimate in thoroughness and, uh, and uh, just real objectivity, Jesus' resurrection from the dead is found to be the most plausible 
of any other explanation. This is why Christians make such a big deal about Easter. Is there an element of the miraculous involved in the Christian faith? Faith is necessary. Yes, of course there is the miraculous in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. I mean, people don't rise from the dead every day. This is a miraculous event on one level, but is the argument for the resurrection irrational? Not at all. It's based on some pretty plausible information, and uh, that's why we celebrate. There's good reason to believe in the resurrection, and God has given us the gift of faith to believe. But it's, again, belief that is based on evidence. As 1 Corinthians 15, 14 said, and Paul wrote this, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. There would be no Christianity today without the resurrection. Jesus' resurrection from the dead demonstrates convincingly that Christ is who he said he was. Furthermore, Jesus' resurrection validates his divinity. It sets him apart from all other great religious leaders who have ever lived. Think of all those who have come and gone over time. Their graves are with us today. And what's left of their remains are still in those graves, of course. But Jesus, on the other hand, is alive. There's no uh, no evidence of his body left behind. The historical evidence for the resurrection overwhelmingly supports Jesus' own claim and the faith of multitudes over generations that he alone is the true Son of God, the only way to salvation. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thanks, Mark, for sharing those really good reasons to believe that the resurrection actually happened. And one of the most convincing reasons for me is that people still come to faith. The resurrection power is still at work. At the end of Matthew 27, uh, around 52 and 53, there's these weird verses that at the resurrection of Jesus, there are other people, other saints walking around Jerusalem. It's like the resurrection power of Jesus just had to kind of spread out and just popped up everywhere. And it's still happening today. Then we go to Ephesians 1, verses 19 and 20. We see that faith happens because of this resurrection power. There was a young man, he just full of anger, taking it out on his family, and his, his wife and his mother-in-law were believers, and his mother-in-law was getting sick. And it was beautiful how the church gathered around that family, loving them. And after she passed, this man, he said, I'm going to church. And everybody was like, um what good can come from this? He's just going to make a scene. He's going to make, who knows what he's going to, he's going to say. And there was good reason to believe that because he, he sits down in the back pew, arms crossed, staring down the pastor. Thankfully, it wasn't me. <laughs> and by the end of the sermon, by the end of the service, he's down on his hands and knees, seeking God's forgiveness, wanting to make things right with his family. The resurrection power at work, creating faith. There's a woman, I met her when she was about 90, and you didn't want to mess with her. You didn't want to get on her bad side. And I must have, because there was one day of of utter frustration with her, and and I, I thought to myself, thankfully I didn't say it, I thought to myself, Lord, how can you work through this woman? And a couple days later, I was reminded, Andy, Why should I work through you? How are you any different? Your sins are probably more socially acceptable. That's the only difference. You're both you're both sinners. And thankfully, I I confessed my sin to God, received God's forgiveness. And that lady, she passed away this spring. And at her, she lived with her her son and her daughter-in-law, and that relationship was, shall we say, complicated. And I was kind of wondering, like, after that service, what's going to happen to this family? Are they just going to be glad to be done with Christians? After the service, 
the son comes up to the pastor and says, you know, my mom, she prayed to Jesus. Can you teach me how to do that? Resurrection power still at work today, bringing new life. Those are some really amazing examples of this resurrection, new life power that we're talking about, Andy. And I think that all of us are getting this greater sense of how broad and wide of an impact that Easter not only has had, but is continuing to have. I mean, this story began with Jesus coming back from the dead, but it didn't stop there, right? This power and this ability that God has to create new life from something that's dead is something that he continues to do over and over and over again. It's like his specialty. And so that's the amazing reality of the stories we just heard, because the reality is for those of us who are believers, stories like that aren't just like someone else's experiences or, or things that are happening out there. They're your story, too. They're my story and your story. We, you and I, have been raised to new life, too, all because of Jesus. And so perhaps you're wondering this morning, you're like, well, my curiosity's peaked a little bit. What does the resurrection of Jesus have anything to do with? with me? Or how is this resurrection power alive and at work in me? And if you're a Christian, I mean, there's so many ways that this new way of life shows up and bubbles up inside of you right now. But I want to mention just three of the benefits of this new life in Christ that you and I are invited to live in and make a part of who we are today. The first is that you have literally, literally been raised from death to life. Now, I know, know this might catch a few of us off guard because, uh, you know, if you're watching this, it's like you're, I'm very much alive right now. Okay, but what does that mean that I was dead? And yet we know that because of sin, the Bible tells us that we were as good as dead because of our sin and our wickedness and our inability to defeat it. And then we see God stepping in and intervening on our behalf to give us life through His Son. And the Apostle Paul in his letters to the various Christian churches that he visited, he, he talked about this all the time. We, re, we heard this earlier today from Thomas, for Drew, you know. We heard it from Drew. We're reminded about this opportunity that God reminds us that we have literally been brought from death to life. In both Ephesians and Colossians, Paul uses this phrase of us being dead on account of our sin, but God making us alive in Christ. So this truly is a new life that we're not only invited to live in, but it's a gift that we receive. Now, the second benefit of this new life is that we have guaranteed and assured victory over sin. I mean, think about that. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't sin anymore. I think all of us would say that that sounds nice, but that's not how it's going to work. We will continue to have this battle with sin our whole lives, but sin does not have the final say or the final victory I'm sure each of us have those struggles that we carry around with us, those sins that always try to have the upper hand in our lives, the ones that you just can't seem to shake, or the ones that you thought weren't going to be a problem anymore, or even the ones that you don't even notice anymore because you do them so often. But how big of a relief to, for, is it for us to know right here, right now, because of the resurrection, that that sin no longer needs to define you? That because of Jesus' triumph over sin and death, His victory is your victory. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. He says, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this third benefit I want to mention this morning is the fact that this new life that we're given is a refining and a renewing process. Right? We're forgiven, we're given new life, we're assured victory in Christ, and yet all of us are very much a work in progress still, aren't we? Just last night, I got a chance to view what it's like to have this renewing, cleaning power going on. That There's the work of the Holy Spirit inside of each of us. Uh, the main line in our sewer backed up into our basement. And so let's just say that there was lots and lots and lots of, we'll just call it, dirty water floating around. There's a lot of junk down that pipe. And it took a lot of climb, time to clean up. My wife and I, we spent hours on our hands and knees mopping and scrubbing and drying. We used lots and lots of bleach. And in the end, it was like a complete transformation of our basement. In much the same way, the stinky sin in our lives has a tendency to be stuck deep down in who we are. And there are definitely times where that bubbles over out of the surface of our lives like raw sewage, too. 
But thankfully, we have something way more powerful than bleach. We have the literal Spirit of God living inside of us that's constantly scrubbing and constantly renewing and constantly cleaning. It's a lifelong process, and yet as this transformation is taking place, it's making us more and more in the image of God. I mean, think about it for each of you. If you're alive today, there's a good chance that you have parents, you have their genetic makeup and material, and maybe when you were born, someone maybe commented on how much you looked like your mom or your dad. And perhaps as you've grown older, the physical resemblances perhaps become even more and more prominent, right? Like, uh, but there's also something else that happens too. And it's not just the physical attributes that begin to take a resemblance, but it's also our actions and our attitudes. I mean, how many people have said to themselves that they're not going to do those quirky things that they see their parents do, and then lo and behold, they get older and they realize, oh no, I'm sounding just like my dad. Or that is totally something my mom would do. This new renewing life continues to shape and refine and transform our attitudes, our actions, and our image to become more and more like our Savior, how it was designed and intended to be from the beginning. In 2 Corinthians 3, we see this reminder played out. Paul writes, So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. So the fact and the reality that Jesus is alive makes all the difference in the world for you and me right now. And it's still changing our lives today. Ben, I so appreciate what you just had to say, and you're right on with that analysis. But, uh, I mean, you're one of these guys that has the perfect sermon illustration come up at just the right moment. I mean, who could compare their sin to raw sewage unless you'd been working down in your basement after your plumbing problem yesterday? That's awesome. But uh, I just want to say that... Uh, that changing and that renewing process, as you mentioned, goes on in, throughout our lives. And uh, it leads us every single day uh, right on into heaven where we'll be face to face with our Savior and enjoying eternity uh, with Him. And uh, I can't tell you how many I've talked to in life who are bent on just being very short-sighted in their lives. They're, they're living for today, by and large. They're, they're living, uh, trying to climb the ladder to uh, success, as they would define success, for this life, only to discover at the end of it all that after all that climbing, all that effort, their ladder was leaning against the wrong building. They get to the top of whatever goals they have, and they're saying to themselves so often, is this all there is to life? A while back, I came across um, a verse that I felt was quite interesting in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, in which the teacher says, He, meaning God, has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And that verse just struck me, just how important that is, the thought that, that God has given us this internal longing for heaven. And I think it's something the human race has. I mean, the, the human person is restless, Augustine said, until they find their rest in, in him. And I think that's so true. And uh, in other words, it almost seems to be kind of instinctual for humans to ask while they're on the, in some cases, the treadmill of everyday life, is this all there is? But according to this verse that I just shared, God has placed a very subtle longing for eternity in the heart of every human being. And I think that people are on a quest to fill that hunger with something. There's this God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person that that needs to be filled with, with something. And I believe that something is Jesus Christ. And that is the relationship that is good for this life, provides meaning and purpose and certainly uh, joy and all the, the benefits of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. But it also gives us that deep assurance that 
this life isn't all there is and that what he has for us is eternal life, as we read about in Scripture, that this life just isn't all there is. And so that longing can only be filled through, through faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, Jesus said uh, in the 11th chapter of John, uh, after having raised Lazarus from the dead, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. That's quite a promise, isn't it? That's quite a claim for Jesus to have made. And he validates it by the resurrection. That's why this is such a powerful uh, topic for us on Easter Sunday. It's, it's a great evangelistic day, Easter Sunday, to know that Jesus does all of this for us. And there you have it. Faith in Jesus Christ means life after death. It means eternal life in heaven with the Lord. This is our living hope. Praise God for that. There's a reason that we can talk about the resurrection for 2,000 years. There's a lot to talk about. And uh, finally, what does the resurrection accomplish? How does it change and affect me today? Jesus says in Revelation 21, I am making all things new. Underneath all the fear and the anger and the sadness, underneath all that is a great desire for resurrection. And it, and it looks like this. Whenever we say, oh man, if I could only have those last couple of years of marriage back, if I could get those unkind words that I said, if I could just clean up this mess that I've made, if I could get my figure back, my, my hair back, I want it all back. There's a thirst for newness. Do you want a fresh start? Do you want newness? Jesus comes to us and says, I was dead. Now I'm alive. And my life can become your life when we, we unite by faith. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, you are risen from the dead indeed, and we give you all the praise and thanks and glory for all that it does in our lives. It gives us the hope of resurrection. It gives us conquer, uh, conquering over sin and death, and our hearts are just so full today because you've made them full. We thank you so much that we can celebrate even today, even while we're separated, and we pray this in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you could uh, join with us and let's continue uh, worshiping together this morning.
How good is it to be able to celebrate Easter and the resurrection of our risen Savior? How good is it to appreciate the renewing work that God is continuing to do in your life and in my life? I hope you get a chance today to celebrate the risen Savior. I hope you get a chance to continue processing this, what this means. As we've done in weeks past, we're going to have some discussion questions that are available after the worship service. And so I invite you to take a moment, it takes a few extra minutes to look at those and to process those with the people around you. And celebrate what the Lord has done as he's given us his son and new life. Hear now this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And you are 